Good afternoon. Thank you so much for braving the winter weather or threat of winter weather to, um, to join us today. Uh, my name is Diana Waring. I am the director of the Department of the Interior Museum. And um, it is my, my great pleasure to be welcoming you to our, our ongoing lunchtime lecture series. Each month, we highlight one of the workings of our, our various bureaus here at the Department of the Interior. This month, of course, we're, we're highlighting the work of the National Park Service. We have a lot of National Park Service colleagues in the audience, so welcome to you. And, um, and we will be highlighting the, um, the rather interesting and, and um, uh, wonderful conservation work that's been going on at the Jefferson Memorial. I've been uh, passing by week by week and watching uh, what Justine fondly says is the, the skunk stripe. Hopefully it's okay that I call it that too. Uh, but watching it grow and watching the, um, the, uh, the Jefferson Memorial be brought back to its, uh, its original white coloration. Uh, so Justine Bellow serves as the architectural conservator for the no National Mall and Memorial Parks where she oversees the ongoing preservation of a wide variety of uh, memorials and sculptures throughout the urban park. Uh, she maintains extensive expertise in the preservation of historic structures and outdoor sculptures with an emphasis on masonry and bronze materials. Ms. Bello earned her Master's of Science in Historic Preservation at Columbia University in 2007 and prior to joining the National Mall in 2016, uh, she worked as a senior conservator and vice president of operations and conservation solutions incorporated, a Washington DC based <laughs> conservation firm. She was named a professional associate of the American Institute of Conservation in 2010. And please uh, help me in, in welcoming Ms. Justine Bello. Well, thank you, Diana, and thank you all for being here today. Um, Diana gave a great introduction, so we can just skip my first slide and <laughs> get right to it. Um, we have only 45 minutes or so today, and I have a lot to tell you about a park and a memorial and biofilm and lasers. So without delay, let's have at it. So when most folks think of the Je Jefferson Memorial, this is the image that's in his or her head. It's proud, it's solitary, it's gleaming white, it's iconic. And the word iconic is really no understatement. Um, so at NAMA, and forgive me if I slip into <laughs> using the acronym, um, the Jefferson Memorial is one of our three icons along with Lincoln Memorial and uh, the Washington Monument. And icon is a word that we take really seriously. Um, this is a word that ha implies a lot of meaning. Um, it has a lot of symbolism both for us in the park and nationwide. So the picture today is a little bit more like what you see, uh, I guess that's on your right there. Um, the clean image is taken in 23, uh, 20, 2003 and the soiled one is in 2016. So you can see there's a really big disconnect between the ideal and the reality. So the question before us is how do we get back to that ideal? The ideal that exists originally for any memorial, any monument, any structure is the original design. So the design that we have here is from the famed architect John Russell Pope. Um, this is one of several designs that were put forward. Uh, he actually died before the memorial could be completed. Um, so we actually don't even have his full rendering of what his vision might have been, um, but we can get pretty close. Um, and so this is a really beautifully rendered um, architectural drawing of his vision for the Jefferson Memorial um, right about 1936. So Pope was not the first to make classical references um, in his design for a memorial. Um, the Lincoln Memorial, which precedes the Jefferson Memorial for sure um, by several decades, you can see directly relates to the Parthenon, uh, which has Greek origins. Uh, the Jefferson Memorial draws a lot of references from the Pantheon, which is Roman, um, so slightly different stylistic uh, references, um, but the same sort of concept and ideals, um, giving a lot of gravitas, a lot of heft, um, and definitely a lot of marble. <laughs> I want to share briefly just a few construction era photos um, just to give a sense of what an incredible architectural and engineering effort this really was. Um, in order to put the Jefferson Memorial on axis with the White House, Land actually had to be created within the tidal basin, so massive foundations went in along here, um, which you can see being laid uh, on your left there. For those that are familiar with this part of town, um, you can actually see that's Inlet Bridge, 
back there, um, very looking very lonely on this sort of barren landscape um, before everything got built up. Uh, but uh, we can see what was soon to come. So because this is a presentation and I'm going to take huge liberties with time travel, <laughs> we're going to jump many, many decades ahead. Um, the mural was dedicated in 1943. Um, we don't actually have a lot of uh, dedication era photos, um, so we're going to skip to 2007. Um, so I'm going to click through the next couple photos without a whole lot of comment, um, but I actually will just ask you all to look at them and consider some visual change over time. So by 2016, we have a name for this advancing dark menace, and it is biofilm. Now, I should be very clear that the biofilm was not first observed in 2016. Um, it had been noticed, uh, certainly, by various conservators, allied professionals, park leadership, um, several years prior um, and research began um, several years before 2016 um, and I can't possibly get into all the research that's been done on this topic so far but I want to touch on just a few of the wide variety of folks that have been involved um, to that end over time. Um, over here we have a young lady who was working with a, a mathematician. They had a grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, they were studying mathematical modeling and how the, our biofilm might be related to that. Students from the Thomas Jefferson High School of Science and Technology in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, were looking at culturing these different uh, types of biofilm and trying to characterize them to understand uh, what they feed on, uh, what they might respond to. Uh, independent researchers from the NIH were looking at it from a microbiological perspective. Other microbiologists from Montana State University um, did a really deep dive into some of the characterization uh, of the different strains of the biofilm that might be present here. So all of this is just to say that defining research goals for this project is vast. Um, just some of the ways that we can generally understand it is that different people have different goals, uh, but we can summarize them in that some folks are trying to characterize this condition. Some folks are trying to understand the phenomenon and possibly predict future behavior better based on that. And others are trying to develop a safe method for elimination. And what we're talking about when we say elimination is really another way of saying cleaning. So why do we clean? Um, I want to be very clear that cleaning should not be a foregone conclusion. It should be something that we as resource managers, as park representatives, should be engaging in actively, um, something that we need to think about and need to be able to articulate our reasoning why we're doing so. So some reasons for why we clean. To promote ongoing maintenance of that resource, to prevent deterioration of that resource, specifically to promote long-term preservation of the stone, uh, if there's any sense that uh, the biofilm or the other soiling agent might actually be causing active deterioration of it. From a curatorial perspective, to restore the original design intent, how it looks, and similar, on, similar lines to that, to enhance the visitor experience, um, which may or may not be negatively impacted based on a change in its, its appearance. So as this breeze board asked, what's that black stuff? And that's a very good question. So let's pause here to talk a little bit about this, what this black stuff is. Um, and this breeze board was out on display behind the memorial uh, for a period of time uh, to try to help interpret what was going on here for the visiting public. So despite what WTOP or the Post might tell you, it's not slime, it's not ooze, it's not goo. Um, it's not just one culprit. Um, it's a very complex system of microorganisms. Um, the word multicultural has actually been used, which I think is kind of <laughs> euphemistic but lovely, um, that are living and thriving really on a receptive host, that being our stone surface that this is a dark colored biofilm, that's not the case with all of them, um, but the dark pigmentation is a protective mechanism, that at the Jefferson Memorial it is fast growing. 
and that it's not exclusive to the Jefferson Memorial either. So some other examples just in and around Washington, D.C. Uh, at the upper left here, we have the uh, D.C. War Memorial. This was actually before it was restored um, in the early uh, 2010, 2012. Um, it was, uh, for those that are familiar with it, it was a pretty heavily wooded area at the time um, that has been thinned out some, um, but it was pretty heavily uh, soiled with biofilm at that time. Um, some headstones from Congressional Cemetery in southeast Washington, D.C., um, the Folger Shakespeare Library, also in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, the amphitheater at uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Um, so this is, again, just within a couple miles of here, um, so just to give you some perspective that uh, biofilm is not new, it's not unique to Washington, D.C. Um, this is something that when you start to look for it, you will find it everywhere. So some things that we don't yet know about it. We don't know exactly which strains might be present or how many might be present. Um, it could change from one location to a few feet uh, distant at another location if and how the relationships between these strains might be changing over time and how quickly, why they might have started to flourish exactly when they did, and why they've thrived so greatly at this location. Um, the Washington Monument, for example, does have a little bit of biofilm on it. You can actually sort of see it in this aerial view at the top, um, but why so little here when we have so much on its neighbor not that far away? So we talked about cleaning a little bit, we broached the subject of it. So if we're committing to the idea that we're going to be doing cleaning, there are some standards and guidelines that we need to be thinking about as we approach designing a project around it. So some of the resources that we have at our disposal as professionals, um, for those of us that are conservators, uh, most of us are members in the American Institute for Conservation. Um, we provide a lot of guidance through their code of ethics. That's something, uh, it's a living document that's updated fairly regularly and that we should be consulting for some ethical guidelines. Um, many folks in this room would be familiar with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Historic Preservation um, in all its various formats. Um, again, these are, these are advisory, they're not regulatory, um, but they do provide a lot of sound guidance um, that's very written in very approachable language, um, that's sort of palatable to a general audience, um, is widely applicable in a lot of situations. On a slightly more technical level, um, we also have things like the technical preservation briefs, the first of which addresses cleaning of historic buildings. Um, these go into a little bit more of a deep dive into some specifics um, that uh, practitioners might be, want to be using when they're considering how to design a project. Um, again, these are all resources at the, our disposal, not mandated, um, but available and worthy of consulting. So for our biofilm here at the Jefferson Memorial, I wanted to talk just a little bit about where it is, uh, because it's not everywhere, it is selective. So it's located mostly on the dome in this area, sort of highlighted up here at the top. Uh, some at the various cornice levels as you step down. And then there's a pretty clean swath across where all the columns and column capitals are. And then it starts to concentrate again uh, as you get towards the bottom, some of the stepped areas and uh, the cornice of the, um, the lower terrace level. So we see it largely on surfaces that mm -hmm. tend to be carved and or projecting and or might be the likeliest to hold moisture for some extended period of time. Um, I'll also comment certainly there is a fair amount of vegetation around the ground level, um, which you don't really get the best sense of um, from this photo, but that certainly is playing into some of the phenomenon that we have there as well. For just a little bit more of a detailed view up at the roof level, you can really see that when we talk about the roof, it's not even just the whole roof, it's really the dome. Um, you can see that just below um, this very heavily soiled dome, there's actually quite a very clean area of this sort of drum wall that's being very clean down here in contrast to this. Um, again, you have a soiled cornice, then fairly unsoiled roof surfaces, and this only picks up again at the portico um, edge there. So 
So in a lot of ways, this effort functionally kicked off in August 2016. As I said, a lot of attention was paid to it prior to that, um, but that is when a lot of things started to coalesce that gave this particular project uh, a boost and kind of lift off the ground. Um, and there are a lot, definitely a lot of caveats to this. So some initial cleaning tests were performed on site that month um, using a variety of different cleaning methods. Uh, some detergent, some water-based, um, some biocidal, some using uh, laser technology. And this information was presented to the public, um, acknowledging that we didn't have an answer yet at that time, but that we were exploring a lot of different options. In the wake of making this information available, we received hundreds of pieces of contact from the public. Um, lots of interest was generated uh, about this subject. Um, so that came in the form of people providing uh, samples, uh, chemicals that they suggest that we try, or providing product data, um, sometimes rep recommending a new technique or technology that we hadn't even heard of before. Um, so there was a vast amount of information that uh, we collected. We sorted through all of it. Um, every single one was reviewed, uh, documented, <laughs> <laughs> organized, um, pros and cons, looked at for all of them, um, and a lot of detail sussed through um, to try to be able to compare apples and oranges across a very, very, very broad spectrum. So I don't think I'm giving a whole lot away if I jump to the punchline that says that we did end up choosing laser, um, and I'll get into why we chose it uh, a little bit later. Um, but as you know from the title, that's where this talk is heading. So uh, I want to get right to the meat of it, um, because I think this is sort of the most novel information for a lot of folks in this audience today. So I want to talk about, um, first just lay some ground rules about, their, about what laser cleaning is not. Um, lasers that we're talking about do not look like this. They do not look like this. <laughs> they definitely do not look like this. <laughs> so we'll just get that out of the way right now. Not even close. What do they look like? Well, there's a variety. Um, so to say there's one type of laser capable of doing this work would not be accurate. There are actually a variety of different types of lasers uh, out there in common practice right now in the conservation field. Um, one type was used for this project, but there are others that are being used all across the world and you know, around the United States right now. So any one of these could have done the, the job. They all have slightly different uh, pros and cons and operate in slightly different ways. Um, but I just want to make you all aware that there's a variety available. So um, when you hear laser, don't think just one laser. Um, there's a big range of options out there. So laser cleaning, <laughs> what is it even doing? Um, how, or how does this process even work? Um, and this is a highly technical topic that we're just going to do the faintest skim on. Um, but essentially, this non-visible light um, ablates the dirt. Um, that's the term that's used for this type of cleaning. Um, it's most effective to remove dark colored soiling from a light colored substrate, or that's the surface underneath, um, such as dark soiling on a white marble like we have here. The light is absorbed by that dark soiling, causing it to ablate. Um, it's reflected back by that light stone that's underneath. Um, in some ways, when managed properly, this can actually really be a, a very safe and self-limiting process, um, because once that dark material is gone, um, it's not going to want to proceed cleaning further. There are some exceptions to that, um, but that's <laughs> with general principle. Um, water misting can sometimes be used to augment the cleaning effect of the laser. Um, this works in two different ways. Uh, this is not to conjure up images of full water cleaning or pressure washers or hoses or um, giant water systems being used. Um, we're talking about just tiny mist spray bottles, um, but sometimes a, a spritz of water will actually um, act as a lens and, uh, and actually sort of focus the light and change its properties. Uh, it can also uh, redirect it um, by, you know, so light's going to want to travel in a straight path. Um, having that little lens can uh, get it into uh, pores that it might not get to otherwise. Um, also, when the light hits that tiny droplet of water, um, it can turn into steam immediately, so you actually have a steam cleaning effect as well. Um, so there are a couple bonuses there. Um, and there, on, on any one of these units, depending on whichever one you select, um, there are many variables that can be fine-tuned to achieve the desired results. These are highly sophisticated instruments um, that should only be used by highly trained operators. So although laser cleaning in common parlance is 
not totally familiar to many. Um, it does have a pretty well established um, <coughs> track record in conservation <laughs> now. Um, some of the earliest work was done in Florence and in Venice in the 1970s, 1980s, um, starting on smaller scales like this, uh, some statuary, certainly scaling up and doing some architectural surfaces as well. Um, but in the decades since, it's been successfully scaled up to buildings as large as the West Block of Parliament in Canada, um, showing that this is not just a, a technology that's limited to a museum <coughs> bench, um, that it actually can be successfully brought in, into the field um, with many, many logistics and variables to be negotiated for sure, um, but that it is a scalable technology. It's actually so widely used that there's a conference every couple of years um, specifically dedicated to lasers and the conservation of artworks. So this is just to say that there are quite a lot of people out there doing good research and good work to this end. Um, and it's being disseminated through vehicles like this. So just a few other examples of uh, laser cleaning that's been done on comparable deck buildings um, in DC, the US Capitol. Um, it's been done by at the Supreme Court of the United States as well, Philadelphia City Hall, um, Cleopatra's Needle in New York. Uh, it's the Egyptian obelisk that was brought there um, in the 19th century. Um, again, West Block in Canada, and a variety of sculptures, architectural services, um, really around the country. So some of the advantages of laser cleaning, um, and these were the types of things were very compelling to the park in making their decision to go this route. So there are no chemicals that are used. Um, certainly that's advantageous to the building. Um, it's advantageous to protect the operators, those are that are, have to normally be applying them. Certainly there's advantages to the natural environment as well. So there's nothing released, uh, there's nothing to be contained, whether it's water, effluent, um, an abrasive blasting media, none of that has to be factored in. Um, the, only, uh, the only media that it consumes really are electricity um, and it emits light. So again, um, there's no consumption of materials there in the traditional sense as well. Uh, it is, well, when, again, when used in the hands of a safe operator, um, it is very safe for use on stone. Um, again, there's no uh, chance of using harsh chemicals or abrasive media. We don't have residue issues. Um, and the runoff is, is really a significant issue, particularly in a location such as that of the Jefferson, um, which has a tidal basin right around it, um, something that we were very, very mindful of. Another thing that's very helpful um, in terms of laser cleaning is that the results are immediately visible. Um, that's not always the case with other cleaning methods. And there are a variety of reasons why we clean <coughs> all types of different methods. Um, some of them take, some of them have what's, very, uh, what's called a very long dwell time. Um, you have to leave a chemical or a poultice or other material on the surface for a certain period of time. Um, even, even then, you might have to repeat it multiple times until you achieve the, res the desired result. Um, one of the advantages of laser cleaning is really right away you know what you're getting. Um, so you get that sort of immediate feedback, which is really helpful in terms of decision making and understanding the level of clean that you can actually achieve. So when thinking about this as a project, some of the questions that I was asking myself about how this is all going to play out were some of these things that I'm just going to kind of go through really quickly and we'll circle back to later. So will laser actually achieve a visible and historically appropriate level of clean? Can this technology really successfully be scaled at this site? Can the challenging logistics of this site be successfully negotiated? Will the resource, the memorial itself, be protected throughout the process? Will the people, the contractors, park service staff, visitors, uh, park police be protected throughout the process? Will our natural resources be protected throughout the process? Um, so there are a lot of things that were sort of puzzling <laughs> through all of our heads as this was getting going. Now, in order to keep this project <clears throat> manageable and useful towards future planning, no one undertook the idea that we would be able to clean the entire dome in the first shot. Um, so we bit off a manageable chunk that was sort of conceived as a test cleaning, um, something that would be very useful for guiding future efforts um, and helpful in terms of understanding those, some of those logistics, some of the technical issues, um, and giving a very solid foundation of work to come. 
So out of a dome that's approximately 10,000 square feet, we identified a 1,000 square foot chunk that would be cleaned as part of this, kind of a pie slice, um, if you can imagine it, down the, uh, from an aerial view of the dome. A very specific scaffold had to be conceived, which was sort of a challenge. Um, this was put out to bid uh, in spring of last year and was awarded in June and uh, the first boots on the ground arrived in late August uh, with work really beginning in earnest in September. Um, so you can see a, a view looking down from the, <laughs> from the scaffold, uh, which was quite an adventure of navigating <laughs> that on a daily basis, uh, where I spent a lot of time over those couple of weeks. You can see it sort of climbing up the, uh, precariously up the side there, um, kind of like an interesting <laughs> caterpillar or something sort of peeking out over the top there. So the laser unit in action, what does this all actually look like in the field? So it's a lot more discreet than you might actually think. So the laser unit itself is here, uh, this fairly benign looking box. There is a fiber optic cable that's attached to it that gives uh, some play to the operator about where he or she can move. It's connected to the end effector uh, where the light is actually released. Um, this is what uh, the operator actually controls. Uh, there is a trigger that has some safety functions on that as well. So this is uh, one of our operators in action. Um, there were normally two lasers that were being used concurrently. On some days, there was a third. Um, so really, one of the limiting resources in this project is the availability of lasers. Um, it's not, well, if this were just a, a normal water cleaning project or chemical cleaning project, you could scale up in terms of people and in terms of materials. Um, the resources there are really not unlimited, really. Um, but here, our resources are fairly limited. Um, but we saw right away that we were getting the cleaning results that we were going for. Um, it's actually very, very hard to see in this photo. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the laser puts out invisible light. So what you're actually seeing when you see it at all uh, is a little ring of plasma on the stone surface. There's just the tiniest little hint of it there in that blue box. And I'll give it a little bit more of a close up in this one. You can see it a little bit better there. Um, again, I mentioned that there are different lasers that operate in different ways. Uh, on some lasers, uh, the beam of light is uh, tracks back and forth in sort of a line, so you end up with a, a cleaning swath that could be anywhere from an inch to three inches thick, um, you know, not dissimilar from that of a pressure washer wand, if that's something that you're familiar with. Um, this one in particular actually goes uh, in a circle, um, so that's about the size of a silver dollar or so. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a silver dollar. <laughs> so we basically have a cleaning tool the size of a silver dollar cleaning the entire dome of the Jefferson Memorial. But it worked. Um, I will also point out there are a number of safety controls that were maintained for this entire process. Um, I touched on logistics a little bit. Um, so obviously access is one. Um, the scaffold was a huge part of this and getting personnel and equipment access to the roof is not an easy thing. Um, but maintaining safety throughout the whole process is definitely important as well. So I did mention that certainly there are no chemical fumes that have to be sustained by these workers, um, nothing that could possibly be um, to, you know, absorbed through skin contact. Um, all those are great. But there are dangers that are associated with the use of the laser as well. And they are very, um, with good planning, they're very easily managed, but they have to be managed very strictly. So uh, this person here is wearing proper PPE or personal protective equipment. Um, you can't really see it, but he ha does have laser wavelength specific goggles on that protect his eyes. That, that being the most important thing, um, a laser light to the eye will blind you immediately. Um, so that is the most critical aspect of this. Um, so there were a number of goggles that were maintained on site at all times. There were check-in and check-out procedures even for visitors. Um, we actually even had a doorbell uh, on the scaffold so you um, could make an audio announcement of yourself um, so no one ever got anywhere near the laser without having verbal confirmation um, that you were properly equipped to be there in its presence. Um, he's also wearing a respirator just in case there's any ablated particulate matter um, that he could possibly inhale. There were some fail-safes that I'm highlighting here. 
on the actual um, trigger as well. You know, it's it is a trigger operation. So when you let go, um, there are it will stop. Um, but there are a couple other neat little tricks that were built into this model. Um, that again, should it fall, should it tip over, um, there were some very good fail safes that were built in um, to prevent any accidental miscontainment of the light. Um, containing the light is important. So this arrow that you see in the back is actually pointing to a laser curtain. Um, and these were draped around the work area. Again, um, they're rated for the specific wavelength of laser that was being used, and they contain that beam. So somebody on the other side of this would not be impacted by uh, that laser beam. So this is happening in real time. Um, so this is the laser light being moved around, and you can actually see the dark is disappearing right before our eyes. But just one more time. So in some ways, <coughs> you might look at this and think, well, that's a little slow. And I actually look at this and think, that's actually quite remarkable um, because, it, because it works. Um, <laughs> we know that this works and that is the most telling thing to me about it is that when you have cleaned that spot, you know it's done. Um, there's no wondering about well, what the next step is. Um, so cleaning was achieved again immediately. We had that immediate feedback about what we were able to do um, and certainly as with most things, as you get practice and comfort, um, both with the site and with the uh, just operating the different um, aspects of the units, you build up a lot of speed. Um, and so, although it took a little bit of growing and figuring things out, um, this was something that by the end of the project they had developed quite a quite a successful method of doing. Um, and we're again, they completed the thousand square feet um, in about four weeks. So, for a little before and after perspective. Um, the before is highlighting just how dark those dark areas really were, and the after is showing just how dramatically white um, it can be. So again, some before and after. So some of the takeaways. Um, I did want to circle back to some of these questions that I asked myself at the beginning um, as I was conceiving this project, um, along with a lot of other folks in the park who had a lot of very, very helpful input towards its end. Um, so will laser achieve a visible, historically appropriate level of clean? Yes. <laughs> can this technology be successfully scaled? Um, well, we showed that yes, it can successfully be scaled to clean a thousand square feet in a fairly short amount of time um, with a fairly limited resources. <coughs> Can the challenging logistics such as roof access um, and equipment access be successfully negotiated? Yes. Will the resource be protected throughout the process? Yes. Um, this was not damaging to the stone in any way, um, and that was protecting the resources is, is obviously one of our greatest concerns. Will contractors, NPS staff, visitors be protected throughout the process? They were. Um, as I mentioned, um, that's largely a function of the safety controls that were put into place. Um, I do want to also take a moment to say how critical U.S. Park Police was in this process, um, how helpful that they were um, in negotiating a lot of this, um, but certainly doing their job to protect all these resources um, in people as well, um, that we ended up having a really great working relationship um, and both got a lot out of it. Um, so they were really, really excellent towards that end. And will natural resources be protected throughout the process? And indeed, they were. So some of our next steps from here, well, we don't intend to leave the stripe just <laughs> looking like this forever. Um, it is very compelling uh, in this sort of before and after sense, um, but we do fully intend to take it the whole nine yards. Um, so we are working to finalize the design for the full cleaning project. Um, after that, we will implement it. Uh, and there will also be a large amount of documentation that will go with that um, in order to help inform um, future cleaning projects as well and to be able to disseminate with other colleagues throughout the field. <laughs>